brought to you by War Thunder. There's something flying in the sky above you that's top secret and efficiently doesn't exist. With incredible experimental engines and based off the technology proven by the SR-71, this black project flies undetected to radar and at an eye-watering hypersonic speed to perform its secret mission. But even more incredible, it's not one plane, but two. Launching at 100,000 feet in the air, this parasite aircraft is capable of powering up to a Tom Cruiser fever dream speed of Mach 15, breaking several human records and reaching near-Earth orbit. This is perhaps one of the biggest speculative aircraft ever thought to exist. This monolithic craft appeared as a rumor alongside the equally mysterious Aurora program in the mid-80s. But did it ever exist? Something is in the sky. What is that? The evidence is more real than you might think. Welcome to the dark side of aviation, the story of the mysterious SR-75, The Penetrator. Our story begins with another famous aircraft, the SR-71 Blackbird. Able to fly beyond Mach 3 and effectively impossible to shoot down, this top secret jet was essential for the Cold War spy game before the rise of spy satellites, serving the US intelligence community from its inception in the 60s. But 20 years later, with the technology slowly becoming obsolete, there's no way that the US government would wind down the program without a replacement in sight. And let me tell you, the obvious answer up in orbit isn't perfect either. While spy satellites are incredibly useful, they can be slower to get into position than spy planes, and you can't change the tech on board once they're launched. A high altitude aircraft can do all of that and more. Thus, near the mid 80s, the US government found itself with a retiring spy plane and a lack of aircraft capability to get to those hard to reach places. They would need a craft that could carry out both military satellite insertions and reconnaissance missions anywhere in the world in less than three hours. Enter the SR-75 Penetrator for the US Air Force. It was actually comprised of two separate components, a mothership and a subcraft parasite that would perform the actual spy missions. Very much alike to the previous generation Lockheed M12 mothership that launched the D-21 Mach 3 drone. Let's start with the mothership. It measured 276 feet in length and had a 120 foot wingspan with a narrow fuselage alike to the SR-71. To operate it, it would have a crew of three, a pilot, a co-pilot, aka a reconnaissance officer who would navigate and take photos if needed and facilitate all the other mission needs, as well as a rear facing launch control officer who would work with the sub craft. They were positioned at the extreme forward section of the aircraft in a small joint cockpit. This mothership was capable of attaining altitudes exceeding 120,000 feet and fly faster than Mach 5 or 3,300 miles per hour. And let's just talk about that speed because it would operate with an engine that the world had never seen before. Called the Pulse Wave Detonation Engine, in layman's terms, the aircraft would actually detonate its fuel in a special chamber at the rear of the aircraft and then ride the shockwave up to a theoretical top speed of Mach 10. It was mechanically simple with these engines that could operate up to an altitude of 30 to 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface and would only require a mix of liquid methane and liquid oxygen. The engines would be slung under the wings in two box-like nacelles about 40 feet in length with vast air intakes at the front in order to get enough oxygen. After all, at the height that this aircraft was operating at, air would be in short supply and would need to be big enough to fit even a VW Beetle. A pair of retractable canards were located just after the third crew member, which could be deployed during slow flight conditions, such as takeoff and landing, to give it much more control and then fully retract at speeds exceeding Mach 3 to reduce air resistance. The aircraft would also have secondary twin high bypass turbo jets that would operate at these slower speeds, but the plane would also require a very long runway for takeoff. 
One such runway that happened to be built at Groom Lake, aka Area 51, around the same time that this project was in operation. Coincidence? Well, we'll get into that later. The SR-75 would also have a tricycle landing gear configuration with two wheels on the nose and four on each main wing. And for all those material science geeks out there, you'll be happy to know that the Penetrator consisted of composite titanium like the Blackbird that had come before. Lastly, this aircraft had the same suite of sensors as the SR-71, including a sensitive gamma radiation sensor for detecting hidden nuclear weapons. But it's the parasitic subcraft where it gets a little bit more interesting. Now I bet you're watching this and wondering, I bet if I was a Cold War pilot, I'd be able to chase down this black project and defend my country's border. Well, you can totally see how good a pilot you really are with today's video sponsor, War Thunder. Don't fast forward that timeline because I'm actually inviting you to come and play with me and fly some of the craziest aircraft ever built in War Thunder, a free online military vehicle combat game. You see, War Thunder features over 2,000 different land, sea and air machines from the 1920s to the Cold War that you can fly, drive and cruise to challenge yourself to be better than the aces of the past. With my favorite one being so far, the F-82E Twin Mustang, with its iconic double fuselage, the last propeller planes before the US Air Force switched to jet engines. Of course, this might be a bad idea because now I'm a bigger target to shoot down. And there are updates every few months with more content, like the one that just dropped featuring some insane tanks, like the flat Soviet tank object 775 and the F triple one a aardvark for the usa which i can't wait to fly because apparently it has the most rockets of any aircraft ever put in the game you can also play solo missions or my favorite in huge air battles with over a hundred different maps that's right huge battles that we can actually all play together we played a few weeks ago and it was the most chaos that i've ever seen in a long time in a match and i still am very much a beginner at the game so you still have a great chance to save me from other players or if you really want to you can have a go trying to shoot me down plus when you make an account with my link you get a free bonus premium tank aircraft and ship as well as a boost to your account now I can already hear your excuses, but the game is actually free to play across all platforms, PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, and you can cross-play with anybody on any device. So you don't need anything, just a keyboard and a mouse on a basic PC will play it. So no excuse not to make an account below with my link, do the tutorial, and come play with me at the end of this month. It's going to be an absolute blast, I know, and there'll be details in a pinned message down in the comments. Okay, back to the show. The smaller parasitic aircraft, dubbed the SR-74, or otherwise known as the XR-7 Thunder Dart, would sit on top of the mothership during takeoff and launch mid-flight to perform its mission. At 90 feet in length with twin vertical stabilizers, it would have a crew of two and have a fantastic near-orbit capability. Yes, that's right, this bad boy can be launched from a mothership at around 100,000 feet and deploy materials up to 800,000 feet, or 151 miles above the Earth's surface. And trust me, there is nothing that could shoot down this aircraft at that point, let alone having to worry about entering other countries' borders. And this was all thanks to its two scramjet engines. They were supersonic ramjets that would burn a liquid methane with a boron-based additive, giving it a range of around 250 nautical miles at Mach 15. Yes, I didn't make a mistake, that's Mach 15. Because the scramjets already require air to be flowing constantly through them to power up, the jet would not be capable of launching itself. It would have to be flown up to that height and at that speed by the mothership. The parasite would also have a small liquid hydrogen rocket on board to place two 1,000 pound classified NSA military satellites into orbit when needed. Although you can totally imagine that these could be swapped out with 1,000 pound unstoppable guided bombs of the radioactive variety. But that wouldn't be its main mission, as the aircraft would also carry multi-spectrum sensors such as optical, radar and infrared. 
capable of mapping a target area down to an accuracy of one inch to 30,000 miles, which is just plainly ridiculous. The combination of all of this was the ultimate spy aircraft that could be deployed for any mission to get any intelligence anywhere in the world. Once the little bird had sent its goods to near-Earth orbit, and I know you're laughing when I say near-Earth at 151 miles up, the jet would then return back to Earth and land at a typical airport like one in the middle of the desert. I also want to specify that multiple sources are saying either the small craft went into orbit or just the rocket on board, and I actually believe the latter, as during the design process, the US military still had access to the shuttle. It actually resembles the Convair Kingfish and Superfish, and very likely the project was directly inspired or utilized learnings from this predecessor. Both aircraft were parasitic aircraft that were supposed to be launched for missions by a mothership and were quite capable of going the speeds required. Now, you might be scratching your head at this point and asking, Nick, just how realistic is this project that no one has even heard of? Now, this project is highly speculative, but based off the myriad of rumors and the sources that I've collected, it does start to paint a bigger picture that makes a lot of sense. Starting in the mid-1980s, the US Air Force and NASA endorsed several studies focusing on aircraft aligning with the descriptions of the Aurora Reconnaissance Aircraft Project. This project was intended to succeed the SR-71 Blackbird, which was slated for retirement in the distant year of 1999. Whilst it had been revealed by various sources that Lockheed's secret of Skunk Works was developing the SR-75 Predator for the US Air Force, the initial discussions of the term Aurora occurred way back in 1985 in the US budget. This term apparently, according to the source of the video, was only for the prototype aircraft leading up to the SR-75. A small sum of $455 million was allocated for the aircraft construction by the fiscal year 1987, with the rest coming from black hole projects in the US budget. Previously, with the Challenger disaster in 1986 and access to space reduced, the military realized this project was needed more than ever and thus the prototypes prioritized to be able to launch those essential spy satellites. Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine were the first to report on this revelation, with the design and construction being awarded to Lockheed's famous Skunk Works, their Advanced Development Projects Division, with Rockwell retaining the structural subcontractor job thanks to both its works on the SR-71 and the North American Aviation XB-70, respectively. Groom Lake was then selected as its testing location, obviously, and suitable hangars and runways were built. The latter remarkably long for only, it seems, a heavy and powerful aircraft design. Coincidence? So what happened next? Well, apparently the SR-75 went fully operational in 1989 after two years of flight testing, with the actual international test flights flying across the planet. Global Security quoted a source that outlined this mission. The Aurora was flown from a base in the Nevada desert to an atoll in the Pacific, and then on to Scotland to refuel before returning to the US at night. A specially modified tanker aircraft was being used to top up the Aurora's tanks with liquid methane fuel in mid-air. The US Air Force was then also using the remote RAF Air Base in Scotland as a staging point thanks to how remote it is. The mystery aircraft dropping in at night before streaking back across the North Pole to America at more than six times the speed of sound. Returning over US soil, it was escorted then by an F-111 Aardvark, which you can actually play in War Thunder, a fighter bomber that was scrambled to fly as close as possible to the black painted aircraft to confuse air traffic control and hide it from civilian controlled radars. With testing showing promise, the budget was then expanded to a range from $4.4 billion to $8 billion, with a procurement of 24 aircraft, one parasite and one mothership each, costing an additional $10 to $24 billion. But all of that would start to come undone. 
By 1995, the US Congress approved $100 million to reinstate the SR-71 fleet and bring three aircraft operational. One viewpoint suggested that the SR-75 penetrator project might have actually been abandoned at this point, either due to cost constraints or technical challenges, leading to the urgent revival of the SR-71 to resume its mobile surveillance duties. You would only do this if there was a flaw with the current plan. On that note, we can turn to Rhino Crates on Secret Projects who said, the hypersonic applications were all the range for a while and then suddenly they weren't. Perhaps not because they suddenly became secret, but because testing showed that they didn't work or they worked but vibration caused cumulative irreparable damage to the airframes. Other possibilities are that they didn't achieve the performance needed to fulfill their intended missions or that the thermal management system had problems that were intraceable with the technology of the day. Or maybe it even worked but was incredibly expensive and required an extensive rebuild after each mission. In some ways, prolonged hypersonic flight is more difficult than space flight. Re-entry from orbit is fast but brief, whilst Mach 6 cruise throughout roasts the plane, its systems and its occupants. And side note, on that we do know that there was a breakthrough with hypersonic technologies only a year or so ago where they 3D printed a cooling system to be built into the engine. They didn't have that technology back then. As for the SR-75 airframe prototype, the Super Black Reconnaissance System may in fact be in seclusion, mothballed at Groom Lake or rumoured at a highly classified new test site in Colorado. With its technology going on to develop the incredible Boeing X-37 space plane, which very much does exist and will be a future video on the channel, so be sure to subscribe. So let's actually answer one of the big questions. Why would the US actually build this aircraft and does it really exist? First, I want to answer the exact question that's in the comments. Why build this when you have spy satellites? It's true that satellites do some of the missions formerly handled by aircraft. Satellites can provide strategic intelligence but have a number of drawbacks. They orbit at a predictable flight path so the enemy knows when they're coming and they would know when to stop their nefarious secret activities or more simply just bring the equipment inside away from prying satellite eyes. The US military at Groom Lake and other test installations do this all the time for the likes of Russian or Chinese satellites. Manned aeroplanes or reconnaissance drones do not have that limitation. By their nature, if the launch spot is not known, the enemy doesn't even know where to begin looking for their arrival. The launch of a parasite type vehicle from the back of say the SR-75 type mothership would be an additional layer to keep the precise launch point a complete secret. Other than the other problems of satellites is that their optics can actually be blinded by high-powered laser arm devices and fired from the ground, which is not possible against a hypersonic aircraft. Plus, to intercept a hypersonic vehicle, you require an inception system that can not only detect, but also do the extremely rapid mathematical calculations in order to place an intercepting set of devices where the recon plane is going. And all of this with a machine that's moving at Mach 7 air speeds? Fewer nations can afford such systems, and even fewer can build them. Lastly, we know that the US perfected the technology with a Lockheed M21 and its drone on board, which was easily prototyped a good 40 years ago. So you were telling me that this whole time they just sat on the technology and never built a 2.0 version? Well, what other evidence do we have that it exists? Apart from rumours on websites that you would be embarrassed to have in your search history, there are a few other examples. For one, the model makers have been putting together pretty much accurate kits of the aircraft for the last 30 years. For particular, a designer, Bondo, Phil Brandt, put together a highly detailed model from various sources, and seeing that he absolutely nailed the F-117 a few years earlier, much to the shock of the Air Force, maybe he struck gold again. But that's not all. According to the source of this video, there are some eyewitness accounts. Evidence for the existence of the SR-75, or also known throughout the community as the Brilliant Buzzard, 
comes from multiple sources including eyewitnesses and earwitness reports from residents of the Palmdale, Lancaster area. Witnesses describe a high-speed aircraft characterized by a very loud, deep and rumbling roar reminiscent of heavy lift rockets. When observed at a medium altitude, this type of aircraft makes a pulsing sound and leaves a thick, segmented smoke trail, very typical of a pulse detonation wave engine. But the source doesn't just come from America, but in England as well. Captain Tom Illes from the RAF recounts an encounter with an unidentified aircraft over his residence near the US Air Force Base in Suffolk around 2am on Sunday morning in 1993. Startled awake, he describes a particular pulsating engine noise of the aircraft unlike that he had ever heard before. The lights of the mysterious craft vanish in the direction of the Air Force Base and upon inquiring with a senior officer, the next day he was sternly instructed to cease investigations immediately. He would then go on records to say that this sighting was the new stealth aircraft known only as the Aurora. With so many people witnessing such a contrail, you have to start to wonder how so many people could get it right. Maybe some viewers have seen these types of donut clouds in the sky, and if you have, I'd love to know in the comments. But everybody knows that eyewitness testimony can be a little bit shaky, so what about actual data? Well, starting in the early 90s, a series of particular sonic booms emerged in Southern California, which were detected and recorded by sensors belonging to the United States Geological Survey. They were originally designed to pinpoint earthquake epicenters. These sonic booms exhibited characteristics typical of a smaller vehicle, distinct from the 37 meter long space shuttle orbiter. Notably, neither the shuttle nor NASA's lone SR-71B were in operation in those days when the sonic booms were documented. In an article titled In Plain Sight, published in the Washington City paper back in 1992, Jim Mori, one of the seismologists, remarked, We can't discern anything about the vehicle. They appear more intense than other occasional sonic booms that we record. And then all of them record on a Thursday morning around the same time between 4 and 7 a.m. The article would then go on to quote Dom Maglari, a former NASA sonic boom expert who analyzed the 15-year-old sonic boom data from the California Institute of Technology and concluded the data indicated something at 90,000 feet, approximately 27 kilometers, flying at Mach 4 to Mach 5.2. And he also noted that these booms didn't resemble those produced by any aircraft traversing the atmosphere several miles away at Los Angeles International Airport. Instead, they seemed to be the result of booms from high altitude aircraft directly above the ground traveling at a significant hypersonic speed. The distinct boom signatures were of two different aircraft patterns that were markedly dissimilar, meaning many experts to believe that there are actually two different aircrafts flying, perhaps our mothership, and its parasite. But what does Lockheed, the supposed creators of this aircraft, say about it? Well, the National Interest cited a book by Ben Rich, who was a former director of the Skunt Works, and he poured cold water into this Aurora hypothesis. Somehow the name Aurora leaked out during congressional appropriations hearings and the media picked up the Aurora item in the budget and the rumor surfaced that it was a top secret project assigned to the Skunk Works to build America's first hypersonic plane. That story persists to this day even though the Aurora was just a codename for the B2 competition funding. And this line is something interesting because we know that Lockheed is actually working on the SR-72 which will be a hypersonic spy drone. Why would they need to work on this when they've already developed this other technology and had it under wraps for so long, and why would they be public about it now? See, it's this type of more logical answers that make me start to think that perhaps we've got it all wrong and that they really did have nothing after the SR-71. But I'll leave you with the account from an offshore oil platform worker and sees an aircraft observator off the coast of Scotland who witnesses aircraft flying. He said, I certainly don't know what lurks up at Area 51, but you should all be very proud of your country. What do you think? What do you believe? And don't forget that we're playing War Thunder by the end of this month. Make sure you make an account and do the tutorial mission first, as it takes about 20 minutes and you don't want to miss out playing with me. I've put a link down to make an account, and when you click that link, you're also supporting the channel, so thank you very much. 
We also have two other videos on the channel about the Aurora program and the TR3B, which you can check out right here on the channel right now. <laughs> Lucky you. So let us know down in the comments what you think and thanks for watching. This video was put together from a variety of sources, but I'd love to highlight the contribution from OpenMinds.net, a great website that covers all sorts of black projects, and my usual partners in crime, AerospaceProjectsReview.com and Secret Projects. Thanks guys.